<laughs> confusing lecture. I had a peek and it looks nice. And it is already up online. Okay, we've already introduced potentials as a, in a funny kind of way where potential is equal to a kinetic energy of a, another particle. But here we're getting more serious the kind of potentials you're more used to. And we have to make a point, and I think that I will do that fairly early, but it really becomes obvious uh, as we try some of the stuff that's at the midway and past midway of this lecture. But anyway, the thing that we did on the very first day was just using two axioms, uh, figure out what happens when two things uh, run into each other, say uh, uh, SUV and VW, boom, uh, calculating that geometrically, but mainly calculating it using two axioms. We have two variables, two uh, inputs, two uh, things to, to use. Now when it comes time uh, to do the super ball and bounce off the uh, floor, we're able to get away with that. That's really a three-body problem. The other body being the earth or some big piece of metal that we bounced off. So there is that moment when all three of the objects are sort of negotiating uh, for what, who's going to get the momentum and how much. And it's three things and we've only got two axioms. You see, so we really should be in deep trouble, but we weren't. We were able to do some pretty good approximations uh, just using those two lousy axioms, uh, conservation of energy, conservation of uh, momentum. Energy, remind me, uh, or let me remind you, it's not an axiom, it's a theorem, the way we've been doing the logic. But is there anything else we can do? Well, the, tr the truth is we really are, uh, when these things are all three in contact, uh, having to negotiate using the potentials and of course when we do these simulations and this is thing I haven't made a point about but I will be making more of a point of it later on uh, we're solving a differential equation and we're doing it numerically and we're using Runge cut a fourth order which is the workhorse for doing uh, that sort of uh, differential equation uh, solving and uh, We'll talk more about that later on, but be aware that's uh, what we're, what our simulations are, are mostly based on uh, for, for pretty much this whole course. Now there's a book by, um, and I meant to bring it up front there, but it's sitting up on the shelf there called uh, Ma Ma uh, Numerical Recipes. And this, uh, it's right, right above you right there. Yeah, that one. And then there are a whole series of them for each of the major languages that are available on computer. Pascal, even, but C, C+, and Fortran. Fortran is uh, one of those things that you'll find in government uh, laboratories still. Mm -hmm. And it's been, it's a dinosaur. It just keeps living. Every, it adapts uh, the good things from other uh, languages. In any case, the numerical recipes book are, are uh, where you would probably go first if you're trying to do some sort of computer simulation. And as I say, we'll talk about that later. In any case, uh, today is where we really deal uh, with uh, the potential that uh, one ball might have against the floor. That's the basic founts uh, in our uh, super ball business here. And, um, the, most of this lecture will be concerned with uh, how potential, how to think about potentials, how to do some calculations with them. But first of all, how do you find one for a, a ball? And this, I think you remember, we um, mentioned the uh, story that I'll tell again about uh, the Super Bowl project <clears throat> when I realized that if I could just measure the spot that the ball left. Uh, uh, um, either using paint, which is very crude, or just simply <clears throat> uh, looking for the uh, residue having painted, uh, having put something on the uh, 
surface that uh, would uh, uh, give us this little number right here as a function of this number and then uh, we can discuss about what that um, uh, gives us as far as the uh, force law what the question is, <coughs> is the Super Bowl bounce force law uh, for um, <coughs> well we're going to do a balloon first that's the easiest as it turns out but in any case the uh, geometry this involved uh, here is is really quite pretty and quite famous. It, it, it really goes back to 600 BCE. Uh, it, it's uh, Mr. Thales, who lived across the bay from Athens. Athens really hadn't developed in 600 BCE that much, but the Turkish um, Empire was going, and. Um, he was, uh, he's known as Thales of Miletes, uh, which is, is, is now in Turkey. And uh, he, he uh, is really the one that's responsible for getting geometry into a stage where it was both uh, uh, beautiful mathematics, but also very useful. Every year the Nile Valley flooded and just basically wiped out all the marks of, of the farmers uh, that were using the land to grow things. And so it was a big argument. They were, well, I had my farm here. No, you didn't. You had it over here, and so forth. And Thales was the one that was able to settle those arguments by basically introducing a, a form of surveying, but it was based on geometry. So they were keeping track, finally, of these things using triangles and, and, and such like. Anyway, this, this is a beautiful theorem here that uh, any point on a, a circle subtends a right angle, the diameter subtends a right angle. And his proof is really quite elegant. If you just look at that much of it, you know, I got some, some more triangles I got to work out here, but if you just draw the whole thing, which is two triangles together to make a rectangle, and you realize a rectangle has 90 degrees, uh, it's kind of the difficulty of that uh, idea goes away. That theorem is basically obvious. But once you've, you've uh, done that, you realize you have similar triangle. This distance here is to that distance there, as that distance is to this right here. So you set that up, and you get uh, all the geometry that you need here. Uh, the, rate, the relationship, the ratio between 2r minus x and r minus x and so forth. So you end up with a beautiful uh, equation here that is the exact equation that we uh, <coughs> will use uh, <clears throat> to get this very precisely, but it's approximated if the x, the, the indentation into the ball is pretty small, that's for x, uh, <clears throat> quite a bit less than uh, the radius of the ball. Uh, we can just worry about this particular field here, the x squared uh, is going to be a tiny contribution that we don't have to worry about. And that's what you do if you remember your, uh, if your UP physics or your sophomore physics doing uh, optics with uh, thin, a uh, thin lens. Uh, th this is the Sagittal approximation that the, uh, some books will mention. Okay. In any case, here we we needed to do this, but the Thales geometry, the ra the uh, ratios uh, there, that's exact, and then this expression here is exact uh, for this. So, as a function of x, how much force? does this ball uh, feel uh, from uh, an infinitely massive uh, floor or wall or whatever it is that it's bouncing uh, or going to bounce off this. Now, if the super ball was a balloon, okay, and uh, we just simply work out uh, what's the pressure times the area, the area of that uh, section there, the pi r squared, little r there, uh, <clears throat> times whatever pressure the balloon has, assuming, and this is another approximation really, uh, that the pressure doesn't change that much just because they changed this volume by that much, which you was know, shown by the cap there. If I uh, take that, then it's kind of neat because, uh, you know, try to keep these uh, guys in sync here, um, <clears throat> even that one right there, which uh, needs to advance as well. Uh, you see what you're going to be getting with just a balloon 
is Hooke's Law. And every physicist goes, hooray, I know how to solve a differential equation that involves Hooke's Law oscillator, right? And that, that's true. Um, but we're, we're uh, quickly realizing that this isn't a balloon. Um, this is a solid ball, and it's the bulk modulus that, and the change in uh, volume that uh, is going to uh, 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 be important for it. And not only that, but for the super ball, it's some kind of weird nutty putty like stuff that really depends on how much, how quickly uh, you punch that ball. Uh, so we've got we've got more work to do, and a lot of it's experimental, as I explained. Uh, in that, uh, well, we'll go over it again uh, today. The project ball. So, um, <clears throat> what we're doing uh, here is just looking uh, <clears throat> at the uh, volume uh, that you uh, have that's been taken away uh, from this volume if you crush the ball. Uh, so that it's flat uh, right there. So we're doing an integral here of pi x and then this thing, r squared, well r was the, this thing right here, uh, <coughs> is the uh, factor that goes uh, with the uh, integral. So it's a good idea just to go ahead and check and see to make sure that that uh, gives you the total volume of the thing uh, if I crush the thing, you know, literally all the way, and I'm doing it mathematically, of course, you can't, no, no, no way that you would do this in a real experiment, but getting four-thirds pi r cubed the volume of the entire ball, if I let the, um, this distance x, uh, the big x <coughs> here, uh, <coughs> go to the full diameter. But in the, be, before we get there, we get this thing right here, and for this, this, uh, this, uh, this, this um, <coughs> big X, uh, <coughs> less than uh, the radius, if you don't hit it too much, then you get a, a force law that has a, an exponent of two, okay, quadratic uh, force. And that's kind of what we were working at, and it wasn't working that well. Um, it turns out that it's a higher power uh, than that. In fact, it appears to not be an integral uh, at all, but then the experiments aren't accurate enough to really uh, settle that issue. In any case, um, we're, we're quickly out of the hook uh, um, discussion uh, uh, with this thing. The power law is something else than one uh, for this uh, particular thing. So uh, much of what we're going to talk about today will be the uh, um, development, and this was what we were really aiming at in Project Ball, and we'll even see um, some of the uh, uh, questions about patent law and all of that today, but this is something uh, somebody named Sterling Colgate patented in 1990. This is 20 years after the, the Project Ball occurred, so he's patenting something that was published, but the idea that if you use uh, not just two balls, but three balls or four balls, then uh, it's really quite um, a, a big gain. And um, <clears throat> if swing the camera over here, the camera will probably not be fast enough to show this, but I'm just going to drop it a short distance. Heard it and it, it, I mean, it really flies. Okay, with four. Okay. So that, that's really what we're after today, is to understand uh, how, uh, when you stack these, up, stack these things up with certain ratios, you really get a big bang out of this thing. And uh, for your astrophysicist, and that's what Sterling Colgate was really uh, uh, involved in, and we'll talk more about his colorful history later on, um, he was uh, one of the first to begin to try to model uh, on a computer, of course, uh, the, all of the d details that he could manage of a Type 1A supernova. So um, that is where this, is, this discussion will sort of end up uh, today. In any case, let's, um, let's go ahead here and, as I mentioned uh, here, 
uh, whatever the power law is, and that can really depend a lot on um, the, uh, I don't think I need to, maybe I'll, I'll go ahead and just leave this one up there for a while, but um, the uh, basic idea of the uh, adiabatic versus isothermal um, motion, uh, <coughs> adiabatic being hit it fast and see nutty putty behavior, a lot of elasticity, or isothermal, much lazier and much uh, lower uh, coefficient and power uh, uh, exponent for the force law. In any case, uh, I would also like to just talk about some pretty strange things that happen. Uh, I would like to just look at the physics of people that can do that. Uh, I, I, I couldn't believe it when I've seen this, but it turns out that there's a guy that does this. I don't think there's a girl that does this, but there is a guy that jumps from 80 feet. I don't know if you, if you can have a feeling for 80 feet. That's high. And he goes like this into a kiddie pool. I mean, it's a pretty big kiddie pool. It's got about oh, more than a meter of water. It's, it, it is, and, you know, got an a inflated side to it. And he just goes like that into that from 80 feet and gets up and bows to the audience, who have been splashed because the water just explodes. And he literally hits the ground pretty hard after the water is all gone, but not enough to uh, what should have been death. He's, he lives through this. <laughs> and what, 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 you know, how many G's is he experiencing? That, that's what we'd like to talk about here. So, uh, the quadratic potential. This is a strip of compared to uh, working out the mechanics of that, which we'll only do a very uh, uh, sketchily. So, uh, let's also look here at the control panel for this uh, demonstration where you can change the collision friction. We've done this already for the case where the thing went through uh, a, a, a pass-through uh, collision. Uh, the gap between the balls, okay, uh, obviously if you have a gap between the balls, no matter how many you have, if you, if you start with a gap, then each collision uh, takes place individually as two, and your two axioms work just fine each time. So you can handle this tower of balls if you make that assumption uh, that uh, each collision uh, completes it itself. Now, uh, I should point out, and this is not pointed out very often, is that the famous apparatus here, jokingly referred to as Newton's balls, and uh, made a lot of money for people that made little racks like this. But in order for it to do that really fantastic thing where one, one if I put one out, it, it comes out uh, and then goes back again, or two comes out. In order to do that, and this is what we'll discuss toward the end of the lecture today, uh, it is necessary that each collision complete itself before the next one happens. So the, the collision, that, the sequence that's going there is, is like a pulse wave. And if it isn't that, you'd never sell this darn thing, and we'll, we'll show that. If you use linear force law, if you lose a, uh, put a one here, all of the funny stuff that we're, we're talking about here, we shoot things really fast, it's gone, it disappears. In other words, the first thing that I did when I discovered this in those long years ago, uh, was sticking a pen into a ball and using it, hoping it would be a marker for something that rotated instead of disappearing in the ceiling, okay? I was expecting what we'll actually see happen uh, with linear force, okay? So, to make a long story short, that's what we're after here. Uh, there's some other things we can talk about later on, and um, we're tr starting to write instruction manuals for our complicated demonstrations, so we hope to have a little bit more on that uh, in the future here. Now, here is a simulation uh, that's quite uh, pretty. Um, I'm going to advance this uh, guy here uh, so you have a picture of it, and uh, I think I will run that one just to 
uh, give you a feeling for uh, what's going on here. So um, it wouldn't hurt to have uh, all of these uh, on this particular uh, object uh, right here. But this one <coughs> has <coughs> a geometrical diagram of how the force uh, would be derived from the physicist's rule for potential function. That is, this is a force vector f is to, and we put an arbitrary constant unit distance right there. This is a, just sort of a trick to get the geometry going uh, for a general potential in force that's variable and is a function of the x, uh, this thing here being a function of x. The idea is that this triangle right here is similar to this triangle here. And that's, again, almost all of what geometry is about. And this is true all the way up into relativistic geometry. It's the ratio, of, the ratios of triangles are playing essentially all of the role of the uh, discussion. But the basic idea is that this side right here, ratio to that, is the same as this side right here, ratio to that. So they're similar triangles. And that's because this is a normal uh, right there that we're uh, using, and it's tangent uh, right there is to that hypotenuse for this triangle. So there's a, there's a way uh, to show at any moment here uh, how big is the force. And uh, when this potential flattens out, uh, this normal comes up and gets really flat, and the projection of it uh, on the x-axis becomes uh, smaller and smaller. And we'll see uh, as we run the animation that that triangle changes radically as we uh, go through here with the green line being the potential uh, here, okay, and the uh, force, the force is a function of x uh, being this line here. Now, uh, this, this particular uh, simulation, and let me back up just a bit to here, is uh, remember that one of the things that you can change or right at the top of the control panel for a uh, bounce it is the gravity. Okay, so we've got a constant gravity turned on uh, for uh, the simulation on these three screens that we're uh, running here. So let me see if I can get it running on this particular uh, screen right here and um, get it slowed down so we can talk about it a little bit just to get some feeling for what's going there. So this is what's going to be going on. It's an oscillator but very anharmonic. And so not much changing as we just have a gravitational uh, attraction and um, you see the great big uh, circle coming in there. Okay, It's coming down. This is on this graph, this is down, and there it is, you see him impressing in, 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 in itself into the floor. So the, the ball essentially uh, stops uh, in each of these cases uh, and uh, gets crushed so that nothing goes into the floor at all. So that, that's the picture, and the uh, section that's getting crushed here uh, is all of this area up to that line. Uh, is that clear? enough for the uh, discussion that we're, we're having here. Now as we um, slow this down, and one of the ways to uh, slow this down is to just control the speed uh, with the exponent here. I can make it 10 times slower by simply making it minus 4. And I'd like to uh, stop at each point of interest uh, on this uh, scenario that we have here. Now it's rising back up again to its, uh, where it started. And no friction at all. It completely turned the friction off. It's, it's interesting to turn it on because eventually it's going to settle uh, right there. But um, we'll talk more about uh, uh, friction uh, in other lectures. But here it comes. Under the influence of a constant force, of gravity, so the, current, the force is not uh, uh, changing at all. And then that force goes to zero. There's an interesting point right there where the force thing crosses the axis. 
Now it's inside there uh, turning uh, with a negative value. Uh, so the, the force is uh, always down until right there. And then finally the floor takes over and says, hey, I don't like you. I'm getting you out of here. I'm pushing up to the right as up uh, to get the ball to accelerate uh, back uh, to its original point. And the other point I want to make uh, is that this side of the thing, since the energy has to be conserved, when it stops there, that's a particular altitude we started with, we have to go to exactly that altitude uh, on the energy scale, potential energy scale, uh, uh, when we uh, reach the very, the very furthest into the uh, floor that that ball goes, which is occurring right now with maximum force, given uh, power law. Uh, uh, for this thing. And right now, uh, the force constant is a huge number for what we've been using, but the force power law is 4. Uh, that's been set to 4. So this is an x to the 4th, very nonlinear force uh, that we're talking about here. And it's the nonlinearity that makes the bounce uh, uh, happen. So, but that's about all I need to say. Now we'll go through and look at it uh, one more uh, uh, time here. Notice the user guide button at the top. Say again? There's a user guide button at the top of this now. So there's... Oh, you, you're talking about... Um, in the, the app itself, yes. This thing right here? Uh, no, over my way a little. This... Oh, oh, yeah. yes. That's not well, that what DC here. is talking about is that <laughs> we have an instruction manual finally uh, for this, this and we're trying to get all of them to have this, but uh, it, it, it is work. Welcome um, recommendation. It, 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 it's, it's one of the hardest parts of making a good demo is to is to tell other people how to do it in English, right, or, or whatever language. Okay. So anyway, um, <clears throat> let me go ahead here and just point out the three major places here. Um, <clears throat> the uh, this is from my original Macintosh System 6 um, Fortran program. Uh, lots of pixels, and, but it's, it's the same as uh, what uh, TC has translated into HTML, which makes it so you don't have to buy a Macintosh uh, at, at their exorbitant prices uh, uh, to use these uh, demos. So um, here is the max, maximum penetration thing uh, at the end of a uh, the deepest uh, uh, point uh, for bending the super ball or crushing the super ball, uh, and then the uh, other uh, it, that's the other end of that particular uh, energy uh, intersection with the uh, <coughs> potential curve. Okay. Now let's see if there's anything uh, we should uh, note. I guess one of the things to note is um, if you, and one of the things you can do with this is you can grab the, the ball and uh, actually put it in different places. This is something that this old program did fairly well. We haven't really made it very nice yet, but if I can just go and uh, click on the thing in the right place here, maybe. Uh, that's an interesting place right there. Well, not so interesting, maybe. The idea is that if you get the thing pretty close to the bottom, then the oscillation that this thing does is small amplitude. Okay. And by Taylor's or McLaurin series, there's a first term parabola right there. And uh, basically, you have a almost harmonic oscillator uh, going right there. It's just oscillating around the equilibrium, the static equilibrium point, which is sort of the middle of that. Uh, right about there is where the force is zero. Gravity cancels the crushing repulsion of, of, the, of the ball uh, at the bottom of that uh, of curve. So just be aware that there are ways to manipulate the actual position of the ball and uh, we we're going to, I think, improve on that uh, to, you know, make some more, more complicated demonstrations uh, later on. 
in any case, um, take the thing back up uh, to whatever height you want and um, take the uh, power law here back to minus 3 or even minus 2. That's lossy. And that's, <laughs> that's too much. Okay. That's ridiculous. You're, you're, you're losing energy there uh, just by having the wrong cut of uh, um, thing um, not behaving. Uh, very well. So um, let me drag this guy up to about here. And there are two ways to set the ball. You can set the position and the velocity uh, uh, just by clicking intelligently. I forget how to do that right now. We don't need it uh, for what we're doing here. Now let me go ahead here. Um, I should point out linear setting. We're going to use that uh, sooner or later. Uh, in a discussion. Uh, we'll, we'll come to that. Here is an actual picture of what we're doing with a much weaker gravity force, much less gravity force, okay, much less slope, and then we still have a high power, uh, very nonlinear uh, force uh, curve uh, due to the um, whatever is going on inside the ball that makes up uh, for, for that particular force. So um, maximum kinetic energy is obviously um, had right here. That's the lowest point in the potential. So it has to be the maximum kinetic energy it goes by the, there with more speed than it has anywhere else in this particular uh, oscillation. Maximum force is wherever you stop on the inside and then uh, it gets it out of there very quickly to turn and return you to uh, the same altitude and energy that's where the uh, kinetic energy once again is zero and the energy is totally potential uh, energy. All of that I hope is something that you uh, have ingrained in your thinking so that uh, when we do more complicated mechanical uh, things it won't uh, be a problem. Okay, uh, there are a few other things that I would like to uh, say about this, so I'm going to need um, all three screens here again. Uh, to do that, I will simply <clears throat> pause, and that's something you should remember. If you have a complicated simulation going, you can go on to other screens and leave it running, and the computer will run the thing in the background, but of course that uses CPU time, so if you've got other things you want to do, pretty soon everything slows down. So watch out uh, for that when you're using a whole bunch of these demos uh, 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 together. Okay, um, let me just simply go back to the uh, keynote and get forward on, on, on that as well. The um, thing that I... Uh, We'd also like to indicate here very quickly are just the calculus formulas that go with uh, potential energy force and all of that. Uh, force can be written, uh, and we like to do it for a potential discussion, as the minus, that's the physicist's potential, minus the derivative of the physicist's potential. Uh, with respect to the coordinate in question, there's only one coordinate in question. Uh, here, call it x or y. Um, I'm using x at the moment here. And then the idea that the potential energy is the integral, you see, then the opposite of the derivative uh, with respect to that variable y of the uh, uh, force. And that's the total force. Total force that includes the crushing of the ball and whatever outside gravity force or uh, what, if you were accelerating this thing, it would be uh, uh, taken into account as well. So um, this is uh, the case of a potential for a very heavy uh, super ball, kind of like some of the bowling uh, sized balls that we got from Whammo when we went to visit in the, in the days of the Project Ball. And a uh, very nonlinear uh, object that we're uh, dealing with here that um, is uh, 
giving us that uh, very nonlinear uh, force law. And um, I'm going to go ahead on the screen as well here. And the uh, work, the work integral, okay? The work integral that gives the energy acquired is an area, is an area of the force I've heard. That is, as I come from this point right here and accumulate area, that is negative area, uh, uh, until I get to this point where I stop accumulating negative area and start getting some positive area, uh, I will stop at a point in which this area here is equal to that area. So there's a little bit of a geometrical thing that you might not recognize it at, at first, but I definitely should uh, recognize that in uh, discussion of this, this motion. And uh, there's another uh, integral that uh, um, is uh, going to be true here, and that's the other dimension of space-time, that is the uh, thing that involves the force as a function of time. And in this case, that is called, not work, but impulse, and there are going to be, in general, three for one particle of these, x, y, and z, uh, here. But this one, the fourth dimension, there's just one, and that's with respect to time. And instead of being energy acquired by a particular uh, travel in a, in a space dimension, this is momentum acquired in the one dimension we have of time. So already we're seeing uh, something that's really important in special relativity and general relativity, and that is space-time is four-dimensional, and it involves uh, these very simple equations right here, very simple sophomore calculus and physics. Okay, uh, let's make sure we have it on the screen as well. Okay, so far so good. Uh, let's see if there's anything else that I'm missing. I don't think so. Um, start with just gravity, end up with an enormous force. Area has to be um, not equal, really, but equal with a minus sign. Okay, um, let's get on with this idea of the um, diving into a kiddie pool. <laughs> let's say doing a belly flop in a kiddie pool. And the uh, thing that I would be thinking about here is if I start, say, at 30 meters, that's a little bit higher than uh, 80 feet, but um, who's to quibble about that right now? Both are enormous. If you're talking about human being undergoing uh, the force. And the idea, you see, is uh, here with a constant force in each of the cases, and that is something I want to make a point about, is if the uh, potential starts with a flat, uh, that is, it starts working the force immediately, as soon as this, this uh, performer uh, comes in contact with the surface of the kiddie pool, uh, the force goes to work right away. And it needs to have that happen uh, in order to live, uh, get rid of all of the, uh, well, um, energy that he uh, has. He has now a kinetic energy equal to the, the product of the uh, gravity force, okay, times the distance to, of the fall, say 30 meters to this point right here. And then he's got one meter roughly uh, 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 to get rid of all of that. Okay, so that's the thing to think about is how many G's are we talking about here, okay? He's talking about 1G, 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 a lot of Gs. Well, this area has to be equal to that area, right? So you're talking uh, all during this expression right here, all, all during the uh, uh, getting rid of the kinetic energy, uh, uh, assuming that he gets rid of it right before the floor, doesn't quite as it turns out. He says he gets quite a, when he talks about it, he says he feels like he, he went through the floor. But what else can you feel when you come down a skiddy pool from 80 feet? This is ugh, something to think about, right? Anyway, that's what he is experiencing, 30 Gs. Now, uh, just about 19, uh, 
late 50s, um, they set up a, an experiment at one of the Air Force bases in um, Mexico to uh, test what a person uh, flying in space or going in rockets or anything can stand. The idea was how many G's can you take? And there was a very brave um, colonel, Colonel Stapp, uh, who volunteered to ride on a rocket sled which went down, a, 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 a accelerated for quite a distance with, a, with full blast rockets of some kind. And then it had giant scoops on each side and, and the scoops hit water. So he, he de-accelerated in, in something that was really quite comparable to this. Okay. And they decided that you would die at 50 G's. There was just no way you could live for 50 G's, but you could stand something less than that. So that's, that, that is called one stat, S-T-A-P-P. -P. Okay. It kind of rhymes with stop, <laughs> stop quickly. All right, so the, uh, that experiment is very much uh, in, close to what this crazy performer is doing with the kiddie pool. And um, he's not just surviving, he, he gets up and, you know, um, helps the audience get rid of the water. The, the people are sitting close to him are completely soaked with water because the pool just explodes. And all that kinetic energy that he had goes into mostly the water and quite a bit into his body. Now, um, if you were to um, talk about a um, linear, linear force, this one right here, Okay, which is kind of what we were talking about here. And then uh, you have, as I say here, a, a very gentle slope, potential jump, minus 30. And then uh, the same story, okay, I'm, I'm going to end up uh, up here with this. That, that, um, that would be a, 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 <clears throat> a bit less, I mean the potential jump here is still 30. But, um, let's see if I'm thinking of the thing in the right way here. The um, idea for this particular thing that has a nice uh, medium slope here is it's a heck of a lot less uh, force here. Um, <clears throat> the um, basic idea using these equations is to figure out, you know, how much you, you're feeling. Now, if, if you let yourself uh, have um, a good fraction of, of um, 10 meters, say, um, say I let myself uh, de-accelerate instead of over one meter, I go over three meters, okay, you're only talking about a, a, a 10 G uh, there. And that, that's um, what you would experience uh, just diving off of a very high tower uh, into a swimming pool. Now over at Hyper, um, you can, what, you have a 10 meter uh, tower, right? Okay, so it, when you get on that thing, it looks like you're pretty high, right? And, and of course, uh, Arkansas is famous for having cliffs that are a lot higher that people jump into Beaver Lake. I've experienced some of that. Uh, <clears throat> what I made a mistake of when I did that was I, I didn't point my toes, so my, my feet like that, and my feet, bottom of feet are very sore uh, from uh, doing that. But rest of my was okay, right? Because into the water you go, you get to deaccelerate over several meters. You don't really even feel that at all. Now there's a diver named uh, Lagunas. You remember that guy, the Olympic uh, diver? Okay. Middle of his Olympic performance, what happened? He was doing one of these weird uh, backup thing. Hit his head on the top of the 10 meter, right? Tumbled out of control, landed kind of belly floppy uh, from that height. And everybody said, well, he's out. No, he wasn't. He gets up, goes back, does an absolutely perfect dive, and wins a gold medal. So <laughs> there's an amazing guy right there experiencing all of these forces. Okay, uh, see if there's anything else um, I would like to um, 
say about that. I've been not keeping up with the uh, thing here. This is um, where we change the acceleration a little bit. Um, this, in this particular uh, case, uh, we've taken a force power uh, law of one. So, just for the sake of going back to things that you're more used to, let's do uh, the usual gravity thing until I uh, hit the floor with my little super ball, and now I'm embedded. Here's the super ball again, all frozen. Uh, and here, here's the force. Now, force is linear. Linear force uh, goes with a parabola. So there's a good old y equal x squared, except that the origin of the parabola is not here, but somewhere else at the, underneath the, uh, for the place where the force goes to zero. Okay, so that, that's kind of a nice, uh, m more gentle uh, sort of uh, acceleration. And I'm going to make a point about that, but there you go. Up the parabola, down the parabola, up and then up a straight line. So this is the same thing over again, except now we're, we're imagining a super ball that has a linear force law somehow. Well, a balloon. If this was a balloon, right? We already worked that out, right? So this is kind of what a balloon, a very heavy you know, outside balloon, uh, would uh, behave. Okay. So uh, we've got a couple of examples of looking at that. There's what we're running right now, um, but um, uh, as I say, this is balloon-like, um, and we'll be doing uh, a bit of the calculations for that. Now, when we had the project ball and the idea that we could look at the spot size and get a, a potential, which then would yield the force, we were talking about very little penetration of the super ball. We are talking less than that, just a few pixels on that scale of actually entering the super ball. So whether it was linear or not, uh, we could make use of just the uh, geometry of what was outside of that penetration. We ignore the penetration. But if we had been dealing with something uh, more like um, a squishy a thing that really flattened and went deep, uh, very deeply uh, into the, um, off the floor or the wall or wherever it was hitting, uh, we have to realize that this parabola moves depending on how uh, soft or more uh, uh, hard and finally uh, very hard uh, the, the, uh, the constant or the force uh, constant for the uh, particular object is. So uh, one, one of the things that I would like you to recognize, and this is something that is very applicable to studying what happens when a laser or some other electric field, uh, wave field, infrared, whatever, radio even, uh, hits uh, uh, anything that's made of uh, electronic charge, uh, equal amounts of electronic negative charge and positive nuclear charge, and moves, the field will move the electrons this way, say, and if they do that, then the nuclei uh, may also be moved, but they would be moved uh, the opposite way, usually very much less because they have more mass uh, and don't respond as much as the electrons. But basically what we're talking about whenever we talk about uh, the the electrodynamics of materials. This is the first thing to, to think about, is that uh, you'll be moving charge this way and then letting it go back to equilibrium and taking it to the other side. There's a parabola on the other side that would form as the thing was in the uh, pi phase and then comes back again to zero phase and so forth. So this whole geometry here, and what's really neat is the equilibrium position instantaneous equilibrium position follows a curve here which is just this parabola turned upside down. So I'm going to give you a little simple geometry problem uh, to just draw that and prove that. Be aware that when you're talking about putting uh, um, oscillating forces on something it isn't just back and forth. 
if you're talking about looking closely at, at where it goes, it's back and forth. You got to drop down in energy. And this is not totally appreciated. I can see a lot of cases where uh, ignoring that is a mistake. So it's just a, a fine point that uh, we should be aware of. Okay. Now, um, bounce effects due to nonlinearity. And nonlinear, in fact, I think the graph that I drew is still uh, sitting here, uh, or I, I ask you to imagine drawing, first of all, y equal x, and then y equal x squared, and then y equal x cubed, and so forth. And of course, there's a continuum of powers that you could have put there, so you have a real smear from all the way up to the point where the thing just goes boom, like that. Um, we're somewhere in between that. But this flat is really important. Because that flat is, it gives you that gap. Where you can uh, use just two axioms to do very complicated collision. That's what we're going to make a point of. But I'm going to do it with an allegory. I love doing this because I've worked at both of these places, mostly at this one during the summers. And uh, Livermore and Los Alamos are in competition during the time that I was involved with a number of projects. But the one that was most famous was the um, project to separate uh, uranium isotopes to make um, nuclear fuel more available and uh, hopefully solve the energy crisis at the time. People were lined up uh, 20 deep at gas stations and the hope was that uh, uh, maybe if we could um, use our fuel uh, more efficiently and particularly if we could have uh, nuclear uh, power um, <clears throat> and then electric cars that would re feed off of that, all the world would be all uh, just hunky-dory. Of course, they completely didn't think about the waste problem. Second law of thermodynamics will bite your butt every time. And if you have to decommission a plant like they're going to have to do with our plant sooner or later at Russellville, uh, you got to haul away a bunch of stuff that's hot and put it somewhere. Where are you going to put it? Right? And if you have a whole bunch of these, where you, they, you know, you've got a problem. See, so that, that's, that's what we face. And we will have that problem in triplicate good or more than that if we do discover how to do controlled fusion, because neutrons just go and make a mess of everything we know of. And how to solve that problem is really hard. You can't uh, shield from neutrons with electric fields. They're neutral. So somebody's got to think of, if, you're gonna, uh, if fusion is going to work, we've got a lot of uh, things to solve before that. That's getting a little off thing here, but I always have to preach a little bit here. In any case, I'm naming these things in sort of crappy names, <laughs> uh, Livermore had much more political pull. Los Alamos out there in the desert, who cares about them? And also, th th these people were very, very practical, very uh, uh, ingenious, and, and these people just either got more money and got things done. So I, I, I want to compare these two uh, just to uh, make a point about, um, let's suppose that their project, instead of supplying uranium, was to figure out uh, what the Super Bowls do, okay? Um, here's Rump Company with what you've already seen. This is the geometrical graph. Uh, at this time, they, the computers are very expensive, so uh, I'm imagining this is Los Alamos in a stage where they didn't have an ability to do the simulations that we've been doing this morning, but or this afternoon. But the um, uh, idea of having this little, first of all, the collision uh, completes with the floor, and then the collision occurs between uh, M1 and M2. Okay, so that, that's their uh, discovery, okay, say. And then here comes Livermore, and let's suppose they're presenting this stuff at a meeting, so here's Los Alamos with this, you know, clunky graphics and and here we have uh, graphics that resembles a wedding in, uh, uh, invitation. And not only that, but uh, Grepcorp's got enough money to buy a computer 
which can do numerical integration and follow the two balls completely through uh, their, the process of falling, compressing, and then releasing. Okay? And we can do uh, all of our lettering in Edwardian script. Okay. And that was true. Los Alamos had very clunky sort of in very down-to-earth stuff. Livermore had a lot more money, so everything that they did was more elegant. And they eventually got uh, saddled with the most elegant projects, which continue to this day. They're still trying to uh, get thermonuclear fusion. Uh, by having 20 monstrous lasers all point uh, to a single uh, very small gold uh, uh, pellet of tritium and deuterium. So in a sense, as far as money goes, they're the winners. But the, th the, the thing is, they look over at this and they say, this is just silly. But, but, the numbers we're getting here are not that different. If you did just look at the first two figures or, or you know, this is 2.3, this is 2.5, okay, and, uh, you know, 0.5, well, this is a little different, but not much, okay, 0.6, all right, you know, um, they're, they're, they're in the right ballpark, but they're really crude, geoma simple geometry thing, simple but elegant, but still not precise, this is much more precise. You're getting ridiculous here uh, with our eight or nine figures. But um, that, that's sort of the situation, the politics and all of that, uh, that goes with uh, an organization that does uh, anything. Uh, is, uh, you know, something you should stand back and look at it and see if you can take advantage of it or if you can prevent it from getting in trouble. That's going to be your job, and it's going to be really hard because there are going to be more people. You know, the population is going up. I don't know if you have noticed uh, so, you know, uh, things that were not noticeable are not noticeable. In any case, um, what we do uh, in a simulation like this, and I'm going to turn this one uh, off again so that I don't uh, uh, say and bring this back uh, so we can simulate a couple of things here. But in particular, <clears throat> let's go ahead and uh, get to this point uh, on the uh, lecture sequence here. This is what I would like you to see um, in a minute. But first of all, just the simulation, uh, which I'll do here, and I'll back up, I think, uh, here so we can um, maybe run it on this middle screen. So there it is. And if you just looked at this side of it, um, you wouldn't, unless you were really being precise, see much difference. But boy, the shape is a lot different. Where is that nice 7 to 1? This is 7 to 1 here, slope. Right? Well, it's not there. It gets eaten away. And, uh, but it still ends up at very high. So what, um, what uh, we uh, find is the initial gap between the balls. If we if we set that to zero, that's uh, what you get. Uh, quantitatively, very different uh, as far as the intermediate behavior. Results, not that different. Okay, one figure sort of uh, at the most uh, in best, uh, on the other side of the decimal. Okay, so uh, this is uh, what's I think really remarkable is if you. If you then say, I'm going to put a linear force, I'm going to make this with balloons, balloons that have a Hooke's law. And th this is just, I think this is just so cool uh, that um, it's worth noting. And of course, when it comes to doing linear forces, isn't that what a physicist really loves? Because I can do that analytically. And we will, the normal modes, basically. But look what happens. No throw, right? Practically no throw, just a tiny difference in velocity, right? It goes like that, right? So the effect is gone. So this is where you see that the potential really makes a difference, being first power 
versus second, third, fourth, fifth, all of the nonlinear uh, forces. A lot of lessons to be uh, learned from this in particular. Fasten your seatbelt. Don't just fasten it, make it tight. You want, when you hit, you want a linear force to go to work right away, slowing you down. You don't want to be flying through the air even a few inches, right, in a crash. Because when it comes time to slow you down, it's going to take a lot more force. And that may be the difference between life and death. Now, if you look at race car drivers, guys in those things, they are just in a mummy case. Plus, they have all sorts of stuff to protect their head, right? And they can go through 200 mile an hour crashes very often and not even be injured at all. So it is possible to, um, you know, save yourself uh, quite a bit in this um, world of high speed uh, travel. <clears throat> so um, let me uh, take this one is actually um, uh, one I should uh, <clears throat> go off of. So the, the basic idea here is the cortic is going to bounce you a lot. A linear force goes to work right away. It's the best you can do starting from zero. And uh, gives you that behavior uh, right there. <clears throat> okay, no throw, basically. As I say, fasten your seatbelt tightly. Okay. Now on this one, I'll come back to the uh, lecture as well, bring these guys up. So, lesson for the day, all right? Now we've got a couple of other things, and we're going to have to go a little bit faster through these, but I just wanted you to see that this is the paper that uh, was finally written, and uh, you can read on your own uh, the, um, the uh, Things. I, as I point out, a lot of people do this differently. Um, <clears throat> those of you who work for Brett uh, maybe have seen his demonstration uh, where he puts a golf ball on top of a basketball. Okay. Uh, he has a way to make that safe. Uh, Professor Tinkham, famous group theorist at Harvard, uh, also did the I think, and this has come to years after we published this paper, but it had gotten into the uh, thing called the Flying Cir Circus of Physics that everyone read uh, by Gerald Walker at Cleveland State. And he um, extolled this as a nice demonstration, but warned that uh, they might poke their eyes out, so uh, doing it with a basketball and a golf ball, presumably safe it. Well, it isn't necessarily in front of a crowd of, of 300, uh, and uh, you, you drop the thing and the golf ball hits you in the balls. And that's what happened with Professor Tinker. Okay, and in fact, it's on video. Okay, so that video and the Tacoma Narrows uh, apparently uh, played a lot uh, during these uh, periods. <clears throat> now, uh, this is just a run through of what I talked about, the history of us uh, going down to Whammo because uh, things weren't working too well and you couldn't think of anything else to do. We thought we were going to be very rich. Uh, that's a good lesson, is that you were, we weren't going to be very rich because it's a dangerous thing, uh, sort of. And um, uh, as I say, no dollars for us. But then that's when we went back and figured out what was really going on uh, with this and got a decent uh, curve uh, for the force versus uh, a potential, first a potential versus the thing, and then you take the derivative of that. Uh, to get the force and plug that into an analog computer and then that fit very well except in the regions where we're talking about really heavy uh, things on top. But this allowed us to predict this uh, device here with the multiple balls uh, pretty well and that led to a paper that someone could take seriously. Now uh, this is uh, where I'll ask you to do a geometrical uh, analysis of three just to see uh, what happens. And uh, that is uh, something that I need to put on the other screen here. So I want to make sure that you uh, see just the geometrical tricks that are involved in doing uh, more than uh, one, um, <clears throat> uh, one pair, more than two balls, okay? 
So basically what you do is you, you, you give your 10, 30, and 100 uh, for the balls. So you start with a 100 uh, gram super ball, it's pretty big, uh, and then you have a 30. So you start that one the usual way, okay? But then what you can do is you can set the thing up for the next collision by simply going across here to that point, coming down to this point, and then the next collision is allowed to be made using 30 and 10. You see, and there's the thing, so you swing your compass up, and that's your new result, you see. And you can do that indefinitely, you know, however many balls and whatever masses they were. You can even stick in a, 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 a big one uh, and see how it retards the chain of, of, uh, of collisions. So that, that's a, uh, you know, a pretty good uh, thing. And you can see uh, just from this thing right here that with a um, horsepower of just one, we don't get very much of a, of a throw uh, from this, okay? Um, the, um, the harmonic, the, that particular uh, force law, uh, doesn't uh, 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 give us a very good uh, throw. And uh, you can experiment on your own uh, seeing here that very, very uh, quickly we exceed the absolute maximum that we had for two balls, right? That is one ball and then a tiny speck of a, of a ball, right? The best we could do there was a triple uh, amplification of velocity, which means a ninefold amplification in height, right? And um, that uh, is a, you know, pretty neat thing that you, you, know, you can do better than that by adjusting the ratios, and that's another problem, is what should you make these two balls in terms of ratio so that this one, or uh, better yet, what should this one be given these two uh, to get the best throw of the third? Okay, that's a nice optimization problem which I'll, I'll ask you to investigate. Okay, um, analogies. When you think of something that's going big and slow coming and then exciting a chain uh, of other things, that's kind of the opposite of what a trumpet does, is you have some uh, light, high-speed thing at the, you know, at the mouth of the trumpet, and that is capable with uh, adjust, adjusting the curves there. And, and, and this is something, this is an article that we were looking at while we were doing our project uh, for other reasons. In any case, acoustical horn. Or just the fact that you have a, an earthquake out in the middle of the Indian Ocean or something that does a horrendous motion and sets a wave that's only about that high going at about 4,000 miles an hour, or maybe a little less than that, but still really fast. And ships don't even notice it. You know, the other kinds of waves are much bigger in amplitude than this monster but it's such a monster you don't uh, feel it. But if you have a nice Im impedance matching beach, mm -hmm. look out, you got a tsunami. That's a real death machine. And Hawaii gets these all the time. California even gets them. They even have in uh, Santa Cruz uh, indicators of where you should be if there's a tsunami warning. Fortunately, they uh, had only that one in Japan and it didn't go, it was only a few feet, but it could have been a lot more just things have been right. Okay, now this is where this tower of balls uh, has an analogy. And this is what Sterling Colgate um, is uh, responsible for, and he, he's the one that got the patent that isn't a patent uh, for his um, ball tower uh, that was supposed to be, at, and you can see the the name isn't on there anymore, but he called this the Astro Blaster. There's, this, there's the Astro, and here it's blasting. So the idea was that you cook all the way down to iron, and silica, and oxygen. And what's strange about a supernova is there comes this moment after millions of years, billions of years, uh, where it runs out of nuclear fuel producing the lowest 
the, the low, the low end of the chain, iron 57, I think. And that happens in a, in a few seconds. Apparently, it runs out. Just boom, runs out. So all of these lighter things are just su 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 suspended. The, 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 the tremendous hydrogen bomb is pushing them. It's gone. So that you have this huge thing with enormous gravity. <coughs> so it's boom, 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 blue. It's a tower of balls, but in all directions. That was a, the rough idea that Sterling uh, uh, put. This is the character himself. I know him from two different directions. My ex-wife went to college with his daughter, uh, and then I ran into him briefly at Los Alamos um, <coughs> much later. He doesn't have to work. He's the heir to Colgate toothpaste. He's Sterling Colgate. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know who Mr. Palmali was, but that was the name of the company, Colgate Palmali at the time. In any, any case, he was been at Livermore and he'd been at, um, at um, uh, New Mexico Institute of Technology, which is, he was president, uh, past president. <clears throat> An interesting story there, but we're getting too close and it's kind of dirty. Ask me some other time what happened to him as past president. Why is it past? Okay, that, that's an interesting story in itself. As I say, <clears throat> not told on, on Wikipedia. Okay, but anyway, there's his Astro Blaster, and uh, there's the patent. Okay, and this is, uh, you know, you're, you're talking, uh, he's, he's definitely Johnny come lately because we're 19. Uh, um, <clears throat> 71 really is when we uh, were uh, trying to sell this thing and not succeed. But here's another analogy. This is just really down to Oklahoma Earth. Okay, this is what they rode on in this territory. Buckboard in the 1800s. Okay, it was transportation, man. I mean, you know, it's a lot of distance out there. Okay, Texas even worse, but. Arkansas and Oklahoma, boy, you got to go a long way between towns, right? And so what happens is you're going between the towns and you're going to do that. <coughs> this is really dangerous, especially at 30 miles an hour, which you can easily get a horse to pull it, right? You hit just the wrong kind of rock and you're out of here, right? So it's called a buckboard. It bucks you off the, the board. <laughs> and... Uh, here are a whole bunch of other things that you can look at in your own time, but Newton's balls is definitely a part of the game here. This is just a thing that we've already talked about where I've got a pretty good ratio here and I'm able to get way, way, way up there in terms of velocity amplification. I mean, it's still one, two, and this thing has taken us up to a past uh, almost 10. So, you know, the, the uh, Doing four of them is, is really quite uh, impressive. And by the way, one of the things that's smart about this is that he uh, this thing comes with about six of these, and you lose them pretty quick, <laughs> even indoors. <laughs> so um, that's that's an interesting thing. Now. Um, as I say, we've got just a few minutes to go. We've already looked at the monster mash, which is a geometry of lines that we talked about uh, last time. Uh, here's where you have a speeding car. This is much duller in terms of, but in California, this is what happens all the time. You're zooming along, and all of a sudden, uh, you come to a line of cars that are still stopped for whatever, traffic, disappointing traffic, or uh, construction. So you, you hit the first one, and then uh, that carries through to the second one, to the third, and so forth. And finally, you just have, uh, if this were to keep on going, crunch, 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 crunch. This is a crunch that's done with this zigzag construction. It's very similar to the one that uh, we're using for, a, uh, I think, a more interesting uh, set of collisions. And the other thing would be that you have five speeding cars, and then you just have one stationary car, and they all pile up. Okay, crunch, crunch. Again, it's a zigzag construction, but this is all crunching. You're assuming you stop momentarily on the 45 degree line, right? That was the first thing we did in this class was do the crunch, right? Um, the logic behind that, I remind you uh, of. 
Now, if you have five speeding cars in five states, it, it really depends on when and where you hit. So I, for that one, I say, as they say in New York, forget about it. But um, this one is one that is kind of worth uh, studying. This is sort of the opposite of the crunch. What you have is a bunch of balls with little explosive charges between them going pow, 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 pow. It's a rocket. Okay? And each time you eject uh, one of the masses uh, as, as fast as you can uh, in that particular velocity frame that you're at. Okay? So this is a zigzag construction, construction that's a bit more complicated than the others. But it yields uh, what I think is really uh, one of the most depressing for people that want to travel in the stars, uh, a, a set of equations. Uh, this is the calculus uh, thing. In this case, uh, calculus and uh, winds over geometry. But geometry shows you uh, what's going on here to make a logarithmic result. And um, I should be keeping all of this stuff ahead uh, so that we um, see this final result right there. Okay, And that is the end of the lecture today. But um, the rocket equation. Okay? that you have a velocity of exhaust and that's what's provided by the little pow each time the, the individual mass goes out with the same impulse uh, as the preceding one but you're, you're, you're moving faster each time. Well look at what it says. It's got this thing, logarithm <coughs> of the mass ratio of whatever you started with, that's the final down here in the denominator is uh, wh what you end up with. That's the payload that you're going to have after you've exhausted all of the fuel. Okay, and you start out with this uh, thing here. And you have, this is what you try to, it's called specific impulse, the velocity of the exhaust as a constant. Okay, that's going to determine how much velocity you gain. All right, and then <coughs> after you get there, Hopefully you have some way to do this in reverse, <clears throat> that is, point the other way, so you can slow down and, and visit whatever it is you're going to, say Alpha Centauri. It's out of the question. It's just out of the question uh, the, 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 to do that. We don't, as I say, this is totally a game buster uh, right here. This equation is really very depressing uh, when it comes to uh, hoping that we will see the stars. I'm not going to see it that way. We gotta pull that vacuum apart and do something weird because otherwise we're not getting out of this place. That's your job. <laughs> okay.